Uh, people here in Thailand, they very often ask me, why did I become a monk? And some people ask me like, oh, why did you become a monk? And some people ask me like, why did you become a monk? <laughs> and when you see Buddhism in the Thai newspapers, and what you see is lots of scandals, lots of monks being caught, having sex, stealing money, transferring land into their own name, and all of these kinds of articles. You get something of a warped viewpoint. What the newspapers don't tend to do is come and show you the good things that the temples do. And obviously I see that, so I have a different viewpoint to what you might see in the newspapers. So, people ask me, why did you become a monk? And the fact is that in the monasteries, of, I see the really good things being done. It's a really beautiful tradition. And when you look around the world, you see many different traditions, both in Buddhism and other traditions, all full of a lot of kinds of scandal and a lot of problems. But when you come to Thailand, actually, this is a really beautiful, a really thriving and a really vibrant uh, tradition that we see here. And when I decided to ordain as a monk, I didn't want to become a Christian monk because they wear itchy robes. And I didn't fancy itchy robes, so I thought Buddhism would be more suitable for me. And I decided that having done a series of meditation retreats, being quite familiar with the Thai temple that I used to go and stay in quite often. I decided to become a, a Theravada Buddhist monk. And when you look around the world for the good temples and places, Thailand is the best that is. You have some fantastic temples, you have some great teachers, you have some genuine meditation masters around. And so that's why I decided to come to Thailand. So, I would suggest that people overlook some of the controversies that we see around in Thailand, around the monks. I will mention my own little story of my interaction with the Department of Special Investigation in Thailand when they came to arrest me for murder. <laughs> and they turned up where we were having our weekly meditation and five of them, five of these DSI guys, armed, turned up to come and arrest me. Uh, the worrying thing was not the guns, they came with a nurse. Like, I wanted to know what the nurse was for. Like, are they going to jump on me and beat me up and then she's going to fix me up? Or is she going to like give me an anaesthetic or something so I go quietly? Or truth serum, I, I don't know what she was there for. That was the really worrying part. And so the boss uh, at the hotel, he saw these five guys and he said, no, 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 you're not coming in here. And they said, oh, please. <laughs> and he said, all right, I'll let two of you in, the rest of you can wait out. He didn't want his customers to be scared by these FBI, Thai FBI guys coming in to arrest me. And then he brings them up to meet me. They show me a name and a photograph of some American guy who is wanted for murder. And they said, is this you? <laughs> I said, no. They said, oh, all right then, sorry to bother you. Like, I was like, don't you want to see my passport or some proof that that isn't, because he looked a bit like me in the photograph. I said, no, I'm English, he's American. They said, oh, you know, so it can't be you then. And I said, how long have you been a monk? Why did you become a Thai monk? <laughs> um, what I think had happened was searching for some uh, guy uh, who had come to Thailand and he was hiding out uh, in the monastery as a monk. And he did look a little bit like me, kind of handsome, tall. <laughs> kind of guy. 
And I think what had happened was my photo had been in the Bangkok Post a week earlier to advertise some of the events. And I think the FBI facial recognition software had picked it up. And that's why they had gone to arrest me with a nurse. <laughs> so, um, how did I get onto that story? I can't remember. I would suggest that, from my experience at least, that I've had a fantastic time in the Thai monasteries. They're full of controversies, they're full of weird things, they're full of strange stories. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's really beautiful. And so I want to share some of those things with you over the next few weeks. I brought one example in. Here's an example that I had this morning. And what happens in the temple, people give us yellow buckets. And have you seen these yellow buckets, right? And in these yellow buckets is stacked full of stuff. Just as a parenthesis, as a note, we actually have enough yellow buckets now. So, in fact, if you happen to be in need of a yellow bucket for any reason, you know, we have them going very cheap. Inside these yellow buckets, they have all kinds of stuff, right, which are supposed to be offered to the monks. And uh, so I brought in one of the examples. This I got from a yellow bucket. And this is ginger and chrysanthemum tea. And what I thought was, oh great, I can make up a big pot of ginger and chrysanthemum tea, and then all of you, when you come, you can get, get some tea. Right? And then I opened it up. I'm not kidding, this is exactly what I found, right? I opened up the box. <laughs> so this kind of thing is really interesting to me. I want to put aside judgments of whether we, we like it or dislike it and get into the spirit of why we do these things. Now, there is a reason for this. I mean, when you're giving a yellow bucket, the idea is not really that the stuff in the yellow bucket... By the way, the other side was exactly the same when you open this one up. It's also the same packet. One of the things, they like to give paracetamol. And one of the ideas in Thai Buddhism, and we can discuss whether it's real Buddhism or whether it's Thai culture, because these two things are very closely linked, but they're not the same. Uh, one of the thing, it, things that they have is what you give creates a certain karma around that thing so that that karma will come back to you. So one of the things that they like to give is medicine. And the idea is if you give medicines, then when you get sick, you will get medicine and you will be healed. Now, is that true or not true? Is it real or not real? So all of these kind of traditions are very interesting. And there are explanations for it. It makes a certain kind of sense within the context of the tradition. On the way here today, I drove past the restaurant and it said, all day breakfasts all day breakfast. Do you know where this comes from? This is part of the Western culture. I'm bringing this up as an example for how hard it is to explain your own culture. Do you know where all day breakfasts come from? And there's a picture of bacon and eggs and sausages and fried bread. Do you know where this idea comes from? This came from a psychologist, Edward Bernays. And he was actually Sigmund Freud's nephew. And he wrote a rather poor book, in my opinion, called Propaganda. And it was his ideas that the Nazis used in their propaganda machine. And Bernays was one of the world's first great advertising executives. The first really great one was Claude Hopkins, and he's one of my heroes. But Bernays was like a second generation uh, advertising executive. And he was employed 
buy a bacon company to sell bacon to Americans. And he had this idea, his general idea for advertising. Don't take the market and try to get a bigger share of the market. So there's a certain market for bacon and his bacon company that he was working for gets a certain percentage of that market. And advertisers would try to increase that percentage. Bernays said, that's not what you do. He said, you have to open up an entirely new market. So what he did was, he wrote to a series of health professionals and he asked them, is there anything in bacon that may be good for you? <laughs> right? Of course, there's some things in bacon that are good for you. So these health professionals were very happy to be consulted. Oh, somebody has come to me to ask me for advice. So of course, they write back, there is something good recommended in bacon. And then he made an advert saying, 500 New York doctors say you must eat bacon for breakfast and then list all of these qualities that the people had written about. And that was where you got bacon for breakfast. Before Bernays, nobody had even thought about it. You eat bread or you eat porridge for breakfast, right? Not bacon. It doesn't... If you think about it, bacon is not an obvious breakfast choice. And then this became known as the English breakfast or the American breakfast, right? And now people say in a hotel you get a full breakfast means bacon and eggs and sausage. This was thought of by him. So then you get the idea, well, bacon is not just good for breakfast, you can have it all day. So you have these all day breakfasts. Why is it even thought of as a breakfast? Because of one advertising campaign by Bernays. So I raise this as an example to show you that when we come to a culture, it's very hard to really explain where all the ideas come from in that culture. And the same is true for Buddhism, especially Thai Buddhism. There are explanations, but I think you can over explain things sometimes. Sometimes the thing that we need to do is just absorb into the story and see the story and revel in the story and see how people interact and relate. Sometimes the traditions develop in different directions. So for example, if a Buddhist monk walks into a room in Sri Lanka, or indeed a Tibetan monk walks into a room, everybody is supposed to stand up to show respect for the monk. In Thailand, when the Buddhist monk walks into the room, you're supposed to sit down, make yourself lower than the monk. Complete opposite, right? So when Buddhism got to England, got to the West, and we had these Western monks, and they were supported both by the Thais and the Sri Lankans. <laughs> so when the monk walks into the room, all the Sri Lankans stand up, all the Thais sit down, and the Thais are saying, stand, sit down, sit down, you're so rude, and the Sri Lankans are saying, stand up and show respect. <laughs> the tradition of giving respect to monks is quite an interesting one. According to the Buddhist way, is you don't give respect to monks, you give respect to monkhood, which is a different thing. So you're giving respect to the robes and the position of being a monk, and not to the individual monk himself. And this was a distinction that the Buddha himself introduced. He didn't want people in India at the time making offerings to individual monks because you quickly get into guru worship, right? You start to differentiate like, well, is this monk good? Is that monk good? Which one's a better monk? And like, oh, he's really handsome. I'll give more to him. And 
oh, there's a foreign monk, that's got to be more bun than a Thai monk or something like that. You, you get into crazy kinds of thinking, which is not what the idea is about. So we have this teaching in the temple, when you get your bowl, we're told that this bowl is the Buddha's skull. And so when people are making offerings into the bowl, they're offering it into the Buddha, not into your own uh, as a personal thing. And this is why the monks are not supposed to express preferences uh, when you are making offerings into the bowl. We're not allowed to walk down the street and people are there waiting to put something in the bowl and then we're like, let me see what you've got first, okay. I'll have the banana, not so much of the white rice. <laughs> in fact, at Doi Sutep is interesting. We walk down from the town, you know Doi Sutep, right? The temple in Chiang Mai. You're considered something of a pansy as a monk if you take the elevator, you're supposed to walk up and down the stairs. So we walk, we take the stairs and we go for arms round in the little town there in the morning. And people like to offer bottles of water. Remember I said what you offer, you set up a karma with and that karma will come back to you. So if you offer water, it means in the future, this life, next life, you'll have enough water to drink. But you get 20 bottles of these water, 20 liters, 20 kilograms, and you have to walk back up those stairs all the way up to the temple, right? So what I was doing was like looking around and put the bottles of water down on the stairs all the way up. So if ever you're in Doi Tep and you see bottles of water on the stairs, feel free, help yourself. So explaining a lot of these idiosyncrasies of what you see in Thailand is quite it's quite tricky, but quite interesting. So the monks are taught to uh, interpret any respect that's given is not given personally, it's given to the Sangha. And when you offer something, you're supposed to offer it to the Sangha. Again, this idea that most Thais would not be able to explain to you and yet it is part of their thinking and culture. This idea of what you give to will come back and support you. So if you give something to a particular monk, if you set up a karma with that monk and he's going to support you, maybe. But if you give to the Sangha, then the Sangha will come back and support you. So society supports the Sangha, the Sangha then is a blessing for the society is the way of thinking. So I can illustrate this one time. I was on a bus and I was sitting at the back of the bus coming from Ratchaburi province and there was a lady there and she got on the bus and she had a lot of shopping with her. And part of that shopping was a bag of mangoes. And as she got on the bus, the bag of mangoes fell over and the mangoes started rolling around at the back of the bus. So one or two people helped. Most people just sat there and left her to pick up the mangoes. One of the mangoes came and rolled by my feet and I thought she would feel awkward picking up the mango from around my feet. So I picked the mango up and I held it out to put it into her bag. And she shook her head and was like, no, 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 no. And the man next to me wagged his finger in my face and said, you should not to help. So what's going on there? When you're learning a new culture, you use little moments where things start to click into place. And I realized that she doesn't want me to help her pick up her mangoes. She doesn't feel that that is in the office of the Sangha, that that's the right kind of thing for monks to be helping her. To my mind, it's just a human thing, right? Somebody's in a spot of difficulty and you want to help them a little bit. 
But in her mind, she didn't like the idea of a monk doing this. But what I found interesting was the man next to me wagging his finger in my face. They're saying, you're too great, high and mighty to pick up mangoes. But you're low enough that I can wag my finger in your face and tell you what to do. <laughs> so what's happening is you have this separation of rank and personality. And this is something that you see in Thai culture a lot. And again, maybe some of the Thais here will illustrate or mention it. It's not something that most Thais can put their finger on, but is a difference in the way that the culture approaches things. You know, in a Western culture, we look at the person. We look at a king or a queen or an aristocrat or a judge. And we want to ask, are they worthy of my respect? Whereas in the Thai culture, an office is worthy of respect. Irrespective of whether the person is fulfilling that office to a good enough degree. So one person taught me early on in my Buddhist career. There was a discussion going on about a particular monk who had got up to no good. What had happened was, He'd been caught in a karaoke bar. He'd sneaking out of his temple at night with a lay clothes, and he'd gone for a beer and a, and a sing-song in the local karaoke bar. What do you think? Good behavior or not good behavior? <laughs> and the question was going around in this little seminar, is he a real monk or not a real monk? And their conclusion was, he's a real monk but a fake person. Prater con blom in the time. So I found it very interesting. Again, that was one of these moments where I start to separate. Ah, there's a different thing for a rank of a person and the person who's fulfilling the rank. So as a monk, I was too high to pick up the mangoes. But as a person, I wasn't fulfilling my duty to live up to that rank in which I'd found myself. When we come to look at the Buddha in the scriptures, in the story and in the tradition, there are really three different Buddhas, or maybe four. So I'm going to tell you what all four are, but certainly three very different Buddhas that we can find in the record. The first Buddha was a human being, and his name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he was an Indian minor prince about 2,500 years ago, and it was only about 120 years ago that British archaeologists finally actually proved that he existed. Before that, academics viewed it as a story that had been passed on. That story may or may not be true. Probably the story had some kind of root, but has changed and developed. That was the original academic viewpoint of Buddhism. But this changed when they found out by archaeology that actually these places where the Buddha was did exist uh, this story is depicted on pottery and walls and temples and pillars going all the way back 2,500 years ago. So we can say that he was actually a man who did exist, who was probably a minor prince. He set out in search of enlightenment. And this search took him in two different directions. Now, I'll just give you the overall picture. Aside from this man who lived and breathed and died, there is also in the suttas a superman. So Buddhists, after the time of the Buddha, they kind of changed this human being and made him into a superhuman being out of respect. And after this superhuman being, Later still, they changed the Buddha into virtually a god. So that when you come across the Buddha in some Tibetan traditions, you see him really as this cosmic super god that 
always pre-existed the universe and shining rays of supernatural power across billions of universes and enlightening countless billions upon billions of beings, each of one of whom enlightens countless billions of beings more. So we have this arc going all the way from an ordinary man into this superhuman, super god kind of figure. So these are some of the images that get presented and we need to kind of split when we hear stories or teachings where in this arc does this story come from. The fourth kind of Buddha is not a being at all but a quality. So very often when we pay respect to a Buddha, which we do by bowing, three bows, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, which again, if you want to know about that, ask me at the end. In that sense, the Buddha that we are paying respect to is not a being at all, but a quality. And the enlightenment that the Buddha attained to actually is a quality of all beings. Later traditions called this Buddha nature. And the idea is that everybody has this enlightened quality pre-existing in your being already. So that quality is the Buddha and not the individual man. He attains to that quality the same as you can. So I might mention there is this arc going all the way from a simple human being to a great super god. And so the stories that we get live somewhere in this arc. So the human being, when he set out for enlightenment, there were two main traditions in India at the time. One was called the Samana tradition. And Samana means the monkhood. So the shaved head and the robes come from this tradition. It seems to go all the way back to the Indus Valley civilization, which is about three to five thousand years ago. And this tradition, there were several cities, to us now we would call them small towns, but for then some of the first cities on the earth were in the Indus Valley in North West India. I get confused, east and west, right? You know, we read from left to right, so it should be east-west, but with the compass, they switch it and make it east-west, so it gets confusing for me. Nobody else looks confused by that. <laughs> North-south makes sense. East-west is the wrong way around to my logic. But. What we know of these civilizations, we know that they had very good sewage systems because the sewage systems still exist and if you look up on Google you see lots of pictures of these. Interestingly there was a, also a civilization on Crete at the time who had the same sewage systems. So it seems that the tradition on Crete, which is a long way from the Indus Valley, seems to have come from the same people. The Indus Valley people seemed to have, and I keep using this word seemed because it's very, very murky. We have a few scraps of evidence and archaeologists and anthropologists stitch together this history and they say, well, you know, it began like this and blah, blah, blah. Actually, we have very little evidence. But there was evidence in the Indus Valley civilization of a cross between animals and human beings. So humans with a stag's head, things like this. In Crete, you had the half man, half bull, minotaur, right? So from this, we stitch together the idea that people felt if they can emulate animals, they can get some of the power of that animal. And when you emulate animals, you are leaving the city and the town and you're going into a forest and you're acting like a dog or an animal or a deer of some kind or a bull. 
in the hope that you gain these powers. This idea seems to be very common in religious traditions. And especially in India, this developed into the idea that if you undergo ascetic practices, you will gain supernatural powers, tapas and manas. So the idea being that if you undergo renunciation or starvation or self-mortification, you will gain some kind of power. We still have that idea. You think about Christianity, when you take the sacrament, eating the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We still have this idea that if you consume something, you will start to get that power. It's an interesting idea that is filtered through into our society. And maybe part of the reason for people being vegetarian, because you may not just get the positive power of the animal, you might get the negative power of the animal. We have this idea that what we eat will somehow change the psyche. So this tradition was of people leaving the city and going into the forest. And these days you think of the forest as a nice cuddly place full of nice little tigers and bears and pet plants and snails and all kinds of lovely things. That's how you think of it. This is not how people have thought of forests. Ten years ago I went to stay with the hill tribe people, which I'll tell you about that. I have some funny stories about that. Uh, on Tudong, and Tudong is the Buddhist version of these ascetic practices. And Tudong means you go and live under the trees, you take your bowl into the village for your food. And many monks do this tradition. I've done it myself for two and a half months. I went and lived in the forest outside of this little hill tribe where very difficult to access, no electricity. And the locals were like, why would you do that? They viewed the forest as an evil, dark thing full of nasty animals that will kill you and eat you spirits and ghosts and their view was civilization is you cut the trees down and you plant stuff so this idea of going into the forests is a really controversial and special idea i wondered why i was doing it myself when i was doing <laughs> when i was doing it do you know the story of the sirsaming in Thai, Thais will know this story of when you go into the near the forest you will see a beautiful girl combing her hair and singing a song. It will be so beautiful and alluring and the men will go up to chat her up basically. And once you get very close to her she turns into a tiger, jumps on you and drags you off into the forest to eat you. <laughs> Fabulous stories. So, this idea of going into the forest was to go into this dark, haunted, dangerous place as a renunciation. And when you practice renunciation, you get powers. This is the tradition that got handed down to the Buddha at his time. It was already thousands of years old by the time the Buddha came to it. The other tradition in India at the time was the Vedic tradition. British anthropologists and historians will tell you, or have been telling people for years, this tradition comes from the Aryan people. And the Aryans invaded India uh, and other places. The Nordic culture, Roman culture, all seem to have come from the Aryans. They had this storytelling culture and one part of the Aryan invasion came down into India. The Aryans took with them an idea, again a very unique and controversial idea, that there is within the human psyche something that is immortal, that doesn't die. And they taught that 
a human being or some human beings can attain to this thing that doesn't die. Now it's not immortality. Your body will grow old and sick and die. But something within your soul or your psyche or whatever it is, there is this quality of deathless. And one of the qualities of this deathless thing is it will give you endless happiness without cost. And this is a very unique idea. You're not going to cook this idea up by yourself, right? This, this is a... Just to get this idea, you need to have received it from somewhere. So, this quality called enlightenment, we now call enlightenment, the Buddha knew of it as the amata. Mata means deathless, amata means, sorry, mata means death, amata means deathless. When we come to these stories, we have to be, uh, have a little bit of flexibility. But the current theory is that the Aryans did not invade northern India and the Vedic tradition in India actually grew up in northern India. Some suggestion that that Vedic culture also had ties going all the way to Syria. But so the Buddha had these two different traditions had come to him. On the one hand, he heard about enlightenment. On the other hand, was a tradition of going out into the forest and gaining something special. Certainly by the time of the Buddha, these were two distinct and separate traditions. Very clearly distinct and separate. It's quite probable that he learned the Vedas. If you want to know why, I can tell you why, but just to skip over. Uh, probably he went for 12 years and studied the Vedic tradition and then came back to his home and his family and realized that he still hadn't, even after all this study and after all these recitations, still hadn't found that thing that they were talking about. So he went off to try the other tradition, which is the Samana tradition, the monk's tradition. And he practiced ascetic practices for six years. It's said that he starved himself so thoroughly that when he put his hand on his stomach, he could feel his backbone. Again, these great images. And I'm telling you these stories because very often in Thai temples and Thai society, you will see images of a really emaciated, uh, bearded yogi. And this is the Buddha during his ascetic practices. And he'll have just a bare ribcage and a backbone. This is what it is symbolizing. At the end of all this, six years, he hadn't gained this enlightenment, so he thought, you know what, this isn't working. And at that time there was a Brahmin lady called Sujata who had been cooking up some milk rice. And she offered this milk rice to the Buddha. And he said, you know what, starvation hasn't gained me enlightenment either. So he took the milk rice. And the other ascetics who were with him at the time looked at him and said, what a wuss, and <laughs> in Australian language, and were so disgusted with him, they went off and left this kind of cheapskate, half-hearted guy to eat his rice. It was at this time that the Buddha went and sat underneath the Bodhi tree. And underneath the Bodhi tree he sat and he said, if there is this enlightenment, if it exists at all, then I'm going to sit under this tree until I gain it. If I don't gain it, let my blood turn to dust and my bones crumble. I will not move from this spot until I have attained to this enlightenment, whatever it may be. And this is the key feature of Buddhism, this enlightenment of the Buddha. This is the image that you're seeing depicted. All the traditions, 
all the customs and the cultures and idiosyncrasies and the big boxes with little things in them, uh, all are pointing back to this one big event. I want to mention briefly how we actually know any of this stuff. <clears throat> and there are three main ways that human culture passes on information and traditions. The way that Westerners know of is writing stuff down. The second way is through recitation. And the third way is through story. All of these three ways have advantages and they have disadvantages. But for Westerners, when you come to hear these kind of stories and things, what you want to know is, well, where is it written down? When was it written down? And if it wasn't written down, we can't really believe it. Now, especially with Buddhism, because this information was not written down for about a thousand years after the Buddha. So people say it was a thousand years. Think about a thousand years ago today, what are we, 2015? Uh, so in 1015, what was happening? Harold was yet to be conquered by William the Conqueror. I mean, a thousand years is such a long time ago. <clears throat> But there's a disadvantage with writing things down. One is, the story then lives on a text accessed only by scholars and doesn't exist in people's minds, which is where it's supposed to exist. So it's taking it out of the place where it's supposed to be and storing it somewhere else. Texts are easily damaged by fire, by flood, by mold, deterioration. They don't last very long. Texts, because they only last for 50 or 100 years, have to be copied. And when you copy something, you introduce errors. Can I tell my joke about that? I know some of you know my joke, but some of you don't, so. Um, there was this Christian monk and they were discussing this issue and he thought, you know what, how can we trust our scriptures? So he goes down into the cellar to find the oldest Christian scriptures that he can find. And a day later, or a couple of days later, his friends like are wondering where he's got to. And they go down and they find him in the cellar with these really ancient scriptures. And he was crying. And they said to him, what's the matter? And he said, we introduced the typo into the scriptures. God told us to celebrate, not celibate. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I like this joke. So when you copy texts, you introduce errors and the quality of that material degenerates. Another thing, texts can be altered. If somebody comes along later and changes his mind and says, you know what, I don't think we should teach this or this, they can change it. The second or the other tradition of the three is the chanting, recitation. And this is the way the Buddhist tradition was maintained and the Vedic tradition before it. With recitation, it's possible to learn vast amounts of information, word perfect. The third form of record keeping is stories. And stories are also immensely powerful. And one thing that Westerners, especially scholars, tend to do is they try to separate, well, what's a story and what actually happened? Did the Buddha really say this, or is this a story? But the story is not supposed to be a historical record. A story is supposed to transmit a particular feeling, emotion, and transformation. So it doesn't really matter if the story is historically accurate. 
What matters is that story is part of the tradition. And that story is the way that you relate to things. And we all relate to things through uh, stories. Right? Stories make up the concepts that we have of the world around us. Right? They're shortcuts to understanding a vast and complicated universe. So, we shouldn't take these stories and try to say, are they accurate or are they true? What we should do is take a story and say, what is the story trying to move us towards? So you have many stories in the Buddhist tradition. And if you enter into them as a story, as a vehicle of wisdom, equal to writing, equal to recitation, then they become something very beautiful. I'll give you a quick example. There's a story that my good friend, being a fellow Englishman, Richard Dawkins, you know, the God delusion guy who likes to go around the world and tell people how ridiculous Christianity is and why you should all believe in evolution instead. He likes to bring up an example from Buddhism of why you should not believe Buddhism and you should believe evolution. <clears throat> and this is the story of the Buddha's conception. So in this murals at the Emerald Buddha Temple, each of these sections of the mural describes a part of the Buddha's life. And in it, you have a depiction of the Buddha's mother becoming pregnant. And it's depicted by a white elephant entering into her womb in a dream. And Richard Dawkins says, how can you believe this kind of nonsense, immaculate conception? People don't get conceived by white elephants entering into their womb, they get conceived by genes. And genes work according to evolution. Stop all this religious nonsense and follow evolution. <laughs> this is why I'm not a fan of Richard Dawkins. I kind of like him because he's smarmy and sarcastic and English, and I like that. But. So, the story is, if the Buddha taught this thing that's very special, he's a very special person. And a special person, we want to introduce into the world in a special way. The story is simply there to depict here is a new opportunity arriving in the world for humanity. Do you depict this in temple art by painting the king and the queen having a roll in the hay? <laughs> the royal bed stuff going on? Or do you depict this as a white elephant entering into the womb of the mother? Right? So, the story is not supposed to be a historical record. The story is supposed to announce something. It's supposed to move you in a certain way. Here is, with the birth of this being, a new opportunity for human beings. Fabulous event in the world. That's why they depict it this way. You have to think of some way to depict abstract things in an artistic way. And so this is a beautiful way to depict this particular event. Actually, if I get chance over the weeks, I'm going to show you different parts from the CD. Uh, and we had this trouble. How do you depict Dharma principles, five khandhas, non-self, dependent origination, key teachings in Buddhism? How do you depict them on a CD-ROM? We had this big problem. So, the central part of Buddhism, the thing that everything is supposed to relate to, is this night of enlightenment. And the night of enlightenment is when the Buddha had failed with the two traditions in India to attain to enlightenment. And he sat underneath the Bodhi tree and he determined, now is the time I'm going to get enlightened. According to the myth, the tradition, the legend. At that time, Mara, who is the god of evil or the demon, 
attacked the Buddha to stop him becoming enlightened. Now Mara, just like there are a number of different Buddhas, there are a number of different Maras. Mara can be the evil one, as an evil, demonic, satanic figure. So he does exist as a, a deluder. He wasn't evil per se, he was delusion. And the Mara actually was a very high god rather than a very low demon. But he would come to delude human beings. Mara then is this deluder. Uh, Mara is also our own delusion. The forces of delusion as a psychic phenomenon. If enlightenment is there, also there is the tendency of our mind to get caught up in delusion, in greed, in hatred, in delusion, in ignorance, in sense desire. All of these things take you away from enlightenment just by the nature of the mind. So we can understand Mara also as purely psychic mental phenomenon. There were a couple of other Maras, but I won't go into them here. So I'm going to stop here for this week.